On Christmas morning of 1992, my parents got me a Sega CD. This was different than every other system my family had purchased up to that point in many ways. Our NES came with a pack in multi-car containing Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt. My Genesis came with Sonic the Hedgehog. And our Super Nintendo came with Super Mario World. Every one of these games was available for purchase without the console if you were late to the party. The Sega CD, however, came with a number of pack and titles, none of which would receive a standalone release. We're going to look at the software that launched with the Sega CD that remained exclusive to those who purchased the first systems. This is Retro Impressions, and we are looking at the Sega CD's exclusive pack and titles. The Sega CD was an amazing console that transformed my bedroom into a multimedia center like nothing else at the time could. At $300, it was 25% cheaper than NEC's CD-ROM-ROM, -ROM, and a whopping 57% less expensive than the CDI. It was also accessible here in Southern Oregon where I grew up, unlike the other two that were only a reality as far as what magazines showed. As I hooked the system up and looked over the handful of discs that it came with, one title stood out with its great looking box art. The first game that I played on my new system was Soul Feast. It was developed by Wolf Team in Japan for exclusive release on the Sharp X68000. Sega purchased the distribution rights to the game for release as a pack and title for the new flagship system. At the time, this was an exhilarating experience to put the disc into the drive and see the animated intro come to life. But looking back, it feels like a major misstep to not target a more notable shooter to showcase the system's capabilities. Toshio Yamamoto, who is most known for his work on Ranger X, designed the game while the now legendary Motoi Sakuraba was brought back to compose a Redbook audio version of his original soundtrack, making it one of the first games to have its FM soundtrack presented as Redbook audio in a subsequent port. The soundtrack is incredible, and it's no surprise considering its composer. Raba would later go on to compose the music for most of the Shining series, all of the Star Ocean series, the Dark Souls series, the Golden Sun series, the Tales series. I could go on and on and on, as his body of work is astonishing in quality and quantity. Unfortunately, the game failed to take advantage of the Sega CD's additional scrolling and rotation capabilities. Making it even more disappointing, the game itself matches a port on the Genesis called Soldies that Renovation would release the same year. Overall, it's an average shooter that did some revolutionary things when being ported to the Sega CD. Steve Blum voiced the intro, making it one of his first gigs in another long, outstanding career that's connected to Soul Feast. If you're interested in an in-depth look of this game, check out my coverage in Episode 8. Sega Classics Arcade Collection contained four Genesis games with slight enhancements, making some of them the best available versions to this day. This disc was my introduction to Streets of Rage, and even now, this is one of my favorite games. I was a huge Daredevil fan growing up, and this story reminded me of something right out of that comic. A crime syndicate has taken over the city and government, rendering the police force inept. Officers Blaze, Alex, and Adam decide it's time to take matters into their own hands. Leaving their weapons behind, they take to the streets to track down the mysterious leader and take back their city. This beat em up set the standard of excellence all 16 bit brawlers would be measured against until its sequel raised that bar. It has one of the greatest soundtracks of all time, incredible level design, fantastic gameplay, and to this day, it stands as a great two player experience. In fact, this game is nearly a 30 year testament as to why two player mode is so critical in beat em ups. The developers felt strong enough about this as well and included a second ending that's only obtainable with a second player. This release sees minor enhancements to the sound effects and their voice samples making it the version you need to own. Golden Axe, like every game on this disc, should be part of your collection if you own a Genesis. I rented the sequel on a regular basis, so getting the first one included with my new system was a major win. This is another classic beat-em-up that takes heavy inspiration from the Conan series. In Golden Axe, a tyrant called Death Adder has been on a murderous rampage. He's personally killed family members of each of the three selectable heroes, and has taken the king and princess hostage. Now it's up to you to make things right in the world once again. The original game received one revision that changed how most of the in-game text was worded, but it didn't change the story. They also fixed a non-game breaking glitch that distorted Death Adder's axe during the death animation if the game was beat in two-player mode. Coming to the Sega CD, this game received the most significant changes of the four included on the disc. The whole Genesis soundtrack, effects, and voice samples were scrapped in favor of ones ripped directly from the arcade hardware. The arcade music was put in Redbook audio format, making it nearly the best home port released. There is one massive problem though. 
this version lacks a two-player option in the story mode. Although no one knows the real answer behind this decision, most people agree it was due to the way the Sega CD stored memory and Sega being too cheap or lazy to rewrite the code to make it work without an issue. Still, if you're going to play this by yourself and don't want to play as the chicken leg riding death adder, there is no other version I would recommend you pick up. In the late 80s, I received the Game Boy and packed in with it was the game Tetris. I was absolutely hooked on puzzle games from that moment going forward. To this day, I really enjoy the occasional puzzle game, and at one time I loved Columns every bit as much as Tetris, and I wasn't alone in that feeling. A sizable number of people preferred this Match 3 title game to Tetris, but for me, that feeling faded over time as other games stepped up and executed this formula in superior fashion. I still pick up and play Tetris on a regular basis to this day, but I haven't touched columns in years. If you like these kind of games, it's still worth checking out, but I personally find it mostly nostalgic at this point in my life and not wholly enjoyable. As far as revisions go, this game received one on the Genesis that changes some of the font. Moving to the Sega CD, it received a new Redbook audio track in place of the once silent title screen. Revenge of Shinobi might be one of the most fascinating games ever released. It was developed as a Genesis exclusive sequel to the original Shinobi arcade game. At the same time, another sequel by another team, but for the same game was in development for the arcade. It was called Shadow Dancer. One year later, a game called Shadow Dancer The Secret of Shinobi would release on the Genesis claiming to be the sequel to the Revenge of Shinobi. It has nothing in common with its arcade counterpart. Back to the game at hand though. You play as the Ninja Master Joe. A crime syndicate from the previous game has returned stronger than before killing your master and kidnapping your fiance in their quest to eliminate everyone standing in their way. When the original game released, it featured Rambo as a common thug, Terminator in the flesh, and as the machine, Spider-Man as a villain who would later turn into Batman, and Godzilla as one of the final bosses. It might be the most amazing collection of characters in any game ever published that included a top tier development team. The only issue was that these characters were all included without the license to use them. This game is without a doubt the one containing the most revisions of any Genesis game I know due to the issues stemming from the copyright violations and the changes required to rectify them. Shortly after release, the first revision appeared. Changes include the removal of Rambo, who was substituted for a generic bald guy. The Spider-Man character was altered into a more Spider-Man looking sprite, who would now disappear when defeated. Batman was changed into a literal Batman. A lot of people seem to think that this is the anime character Devilman, but I haven't seen anything to confirm that, and I'm not convinced. What do you think? Around the same time, Sega was able to acquire the rights to the Spider-Man character on the Genesis platform. So Revision 2 was released one year later, containing a copyright notice that they had the rights to use Spider-Man in-game. The final revision on the Genesis replaced Godzilla with a much crazier looking skeleton Godzilla. Coming to the Sega CD, the only changes I could find is that the voices and effects are of much higher quality. From start to finish, this game is incredible, and one you really can't go wrong with no matter which version you end up picking up. And that's a good thing because distinguishing these versions from each other without turning the game on is near impossible. The case the Sega Classics Collection game came in was a bifold with each side containing its own disc. In this case, the other was Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Volume 1. It was based on the popular tabletop game of the same name and was originally developed for release on the FM Towns computer. It would later be ported to numerous systems, including what we're discussing here. Having grown up with game consoles and a computer, this game captures the feeling of that era and preserves it well. In its day, I considered it to be an incredible FMV game, and I'm not alone. It, along with Volume 2, sold over a quarter million copies. Something I feel sold people on the possibilities of full motion video going forward. It did things on a console no other game did before, including a fully voiced reference guide and top-notch acting when compared to the other offerings of the time. This game allows you to solve three unique cases. You travel around London, interviewing various people of interest trying to build your case. It's fairly straightforward and highly reminiscent of a more sophisticated version of Clue. Once you think you've figured it out, you can present your evidence to a judge and try to solve it. 
Although the game would never see a standalone release, it did receive two sequels with Volume 2 releasing on this system. This is a game worth experiencing once just for historical value. But in all fairness, it's only worth a single playthrough, as once you've solved the cases, there's nothing to come back for. Three men dead, and they expect us to believe that the 4,000 year old mummy was the murderer. Not long after the Sega CD release, the classic pack was updated to include Super Monaco GP, and the bifold second disc was replaced with Echo the Dolphin. Super Monaco GP is a Formula 1 racing game that didn't obtain any licensing, but takes you through an entire season where you can race for better cars and the championship. I wouldn't call this true to the sport, but it's one of the best simulation style 16-bit racers on any console. This game has multiple revisions, but it's nearly impossible to tell just what the changes were. Most people feel it had to do with the way that the car handles, but for me, I couldn't tell. And this is a game that would take someone who is intimate with it to really tell what these changes are. As far as this version goes, all the sound effects and voiceovers benefit from increased sample rates. The Sega CD sound chip is also utilized to include additional drums in some of the music tracks. This is a great addition because the limited music in this game is some of the best the fourth generation has to offer. The final disc we're going to look at were also included in a bifold case. Hot Hits Adventurous New Music Sampler is nothing more than a music CD. It honestly isn't that great, and I would have preferred something with video game based music. It might not seem like a worthwhile inclusion looking back, but these two discs along with Soul Feast and the Golden Axe OST were my first CDs, and the Sega CD was the only CD player I owned for years. When this was new, I was happy to own it, but beyond that there isn't much else to say. The other side contained Rock Painting CD Plus G. This was another music CD but with CD Plus G, also known as CD Plus Graphics. This was an amazing concept that allowed the addition of low quality images or video in tandem with Redbook Audio on a single disc. Most CD based consoles including the Saturn, 3DO, TurboGrafx CD ROM ROM and CDI included the ability to play the standard. Although CD Plus G would never gain traction as it was intended, it would become the standard used in karaoke machines. In the end, the Sega CD has received a lot of flack for its pack and titles. Flack that honestly is unjustified. At the time, the included software showcased just what this revolutionary piece of hardware was capable of, while also including some incredible games. It debuted at a price point that made it obtainable to those who really wanted it, and remained a viable system with an incredible library that remains highly desirable to this day. Special thanks to my boys Ezra, Xavier, and Tiberius for helping me capture the two-player footage. Thanks for watching. Feel free to leave a positive or negative comment letting me know your thoughts. Click subscribe and leave a like if you enjoyed the video. If you're interested in staying updated on upcoming projects and channel news, follow me on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Genovi and this has been Retro Impressions and Reviews.